My guest tonight is a country boy who turned a hobby into one of the most dominant careers the world of mixed martial arts has ever seen. For Matthew Allen Hughes, the hard work began on a farm in Hillsboro, Illinois, eventually leading him to the undisputed UFC welterweight championship. He's a two-time belt holder, amassed nine successful title defenses, and won what's been called the greatest fight in UFC history. But before he was inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame, did you know he split wood on the family farm to get stronger, went undefeated as a high school wrestler after his sophomore year, and made $100 for his first professional fight. Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is. A man who once said, if you're undefeated, then you're not fighting the right people. Please welcome UFC legend, Matt Hughes. That was good. Huh? You like that? Yes. I know you are so uncomfortable sitting there in a suit right now. <laughs> just, just, uh, we You want to rip it off, suit. don't you? I like to let people know who I am, and so I wear jeans and a t-shirt everywhere I go. Uh, and so he pressured me into putting this monkey suit on, there. And <laughs> here I am. I am the weakest softest human, I would never pressure you into doing anything. If, <laughs> no, you have, he has other people right, that exactly, does that yeah. for him. <laughs> Let's be clear, I have other people for that. Let's talk about life back in the 70s, born in 1973 in Hillsboro, Illinois, which is uh, not too far away from where I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, the 70s was an interesting time to grow up and you were basically, a, you're a twin. Mm -hmm. and, and born there and kind of a farm boy as a kid. A to total farm boy. We lived about a mile away from our, our next neighbor, so we were very isolated, not by choice, but that's just the area we lived in. And, and um, those two things, being a twin brother like you hit on and being a, a farm boy, really put me who I am today. My dad taught me how to work. We had a lot going on. There wasn't a lot of money back then in farming, so... When my brother and I were born and we were old enough to work, we were a piece of machinery to my dad. You, you do this and you do this and you do this and he was off doing his work, we were doing our work and that's what we did all day is work. Was it just tough? Was there love? Was it, how was it with your father? My dad loved me no doubt. Uh, I don't remember the man ever telling me he loved me. But without him uh, teaching me how to work, I wouldn't be sitting in this chair right now. I talked with your mother, Linda, who is wonderful. And I, I get the sense that if, if he was the tough one, you know, she could be tough, but, but she was also in charge of you and your brother and, and made sure that you knew you had a, a, a warm home. Yeah. Is that true? Yep, very much true. Uh, one thing about back then is uh, we lived on a farm. We worked all day till supper time, and at supper time we had a family meal. So I, I love to get my family together. And, and have that family meal, because a lot of people don't do that nowadays. There's a picture of, of you guys and your sister and your mom and dad. I Don't ask me which one I am, because I don't know. I'm the good looking one, I guess. I right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read where your dad would even offer his boys services to work on other farms. Yeah. yeah. So if your farm wasn't enough and working morning till night, you're going off. You know, I, 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 um, one thing he, I remember him saying when I was probably 13 or 14 year old is, is uh, you never make money off somebody else's misfortunes. And somebody had an accident, we went there and worked all day and we didn't get paid and that's just the way it was. There, there's something there with, with your toughness and with, with the way that, that you were physically working at that farm that started a strength that I think is different from somebody who just got it by lifting weights in a gym. I mean, they talk about country strong and naturally strong. That, to me, is what that means. I, I think it starts before that, uh, Joe. When my mom had twins, she bought one thing, a formula, and it was gone like that. So she said, I can't keep buying this formula. So she was had milk cows, so she would go milk the cow. Unpasteurized milk went right into us, and um, I think that really started the whole process of being strong. That's interesting, so I, I've never heard that before. So instead of like the typical baby formula, you're she getting- went, She went to the cow. She went to the cow. <laughs> and, and what is it about that milk, you think? I think it's just natural. It's just, you're getting natural stuff. Um, it was all hormone free. It was just natural milk. Um, 
that, that we were fed with. Uh, I don't That's know. That's not even fair. You're wearing the same number. I'm, yeah, I was just going to say, you beat me to it. I'm number 19. <laughs> <laughs> I just just to get a sense of what you were doing on the farm, baling hay, yep, tending uh, the livestock. Back then, there wasn't Roundup ready beans, so you go walk beans all summer. Uh, you bale hay in the summertime, in the wintertime. Uh, you're working with the cattle. My dad typically had uh, 60 to 80 head of cattle at the most. He probably had about 100 at one time. So you always had cattle to work with. Farms back then were a lot different. Uh, grain farmers today really have it pretty easy. They work for four weeks in the spring and four weeks in the fall, and that's it. Back then, you may try to make money everywhere. So you had pigs, we had cows. Um, you went off on the farm and baling hay for other people or doing some custom farming. I can remember taking the tractor and, and uh, mower to other farms, baling, uh, mowing hay for them. So you really did whatever you could do to make a buck. So there's the grain embargo and the recession, President Carter back in the 70s and uh, and and it got tight. Around it, did, the house. it did get tight. When I was in junior high, my brother and I, I remember we had three pairs of blue jeans. So you, you wait. Went. Just say that again. So you and your brother had three pairs of pants. Between the both of us, yes. We Between had, the both, so you just trade them around. Yeah, you kind of you 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 maybe wear a pair of jeans two days in a row. Then you either get the other pair, or you just switch with your brother or something. So it it's like college. There's a big process between clean clothes and dirty clothes. There's many steps in there. Right. <laughs> so I they're still, not dirty. They're not really dirty. Dirty, right? You know, they're, Until they're, they're many, dirty. It's a process. So we, we li that's how we we grew up. I, I I read where you and your brother were playing basketball, and a coach or a teacher or somebody saw you because, you know, you guys were physical. We were in fifth grade. Fifth grade, and and this guy says, look, you. Eh, let's pull you apart. You got the wrong sport. Let's figure out wrestling, yeah. right? Yeah. Th that's where it started. Dave was the high school wrestling coach, and he goes, boys, you get to high school, I'm going to have something for you. So, uh, so he was right. He was right, and, and I, I wonder, what, what was the structure of wrestling like for you? Did you like the process of it? Wrestling, if you don't know, wrestling falls in the, in the wintertime. Which so, is good for the farm. Good for the farm. So in the springtime, you're planting. In the fall, you're taking the crops out. You don't have a whole lot of time to run a kid to practice. So wrestling was great. Uh, wrestling also fits my demographic, that you buy a kid a pair of wrestling shoes, and that's about all the money you've got into it. You know, and wrestling shoes are cheap. So, you know, demographically, usually they're, they're not the, the real wealthy kids on the wrestling team. It's just amazing. My dad and my mom, they loved wrestling, so they did all the homework they could. And they were very supportive. My my dad was kind of over the deep end a little bit. He um, we'd go to wrestling practice, then we'd come home, we'd get something to eat, and my dad would put us on a stationary bike while we watched TV. So he just made sure we were in shape. So these are the twins that are, are you taking turns on the stationary yes. bike yes. while you're watching TV. watching TV. Is it fair to say that back in the day, Mark may have been a little bit more natural or a better wrestler than you? He was Mark's more mean than I am. So if if you. <laughs> Which makes a big point that if, if you go to Hillsboro, my town of 5,000 people, and say, hey, I'm going to fight one of the Hughes boys, which one do I want to fight? They would say, you want to fight Matt, because Matt's going to make you say uncle. Mark's going to put you in the hospital. <laughs> so we're talking to a UFC Hall of Famer, and his twin is meaner than he is. I, I, I would definitely say so. At that time, part of your, the interesting thing for me is like this little pampered kid that I was. You're, you're out splitting wood. You're heating the house with this wood. Mm -hmm. And on the axe, I guess, that, that you were using, at some point your dad welds a bigger weight onto it so that you, act, I mean, it was heavy anyway, and you guys mastered that. And he's like, all right, well, let's turn it into more of a workout. He, he was, he was kind of crazy. He went over the deep end, like I said. They have what's called a monster mall, and it's all steel. It's like 15 pounds of steel at the end, and you swing it, and it's the biggest mall that they have. And he wanted to up it up a little bit. So we had two of them, one for Mark and one for me. So he added 10 pounds on top of that. So, I mean, it, it, got, it got heavy. But like I said, it, it made me who I am. And you, you talk about your pampered upbringing. We were so isolated. We didn't know Johnny in town that played basketball every night with his buddies wasn't doing the same thing. We thought every kid was working like a dog on the farm. So we didn't know any different. It was just life. So at this point, when you're a boy, 
What do you want to be when you grow up? No, no idea. There's no thought process. You know, when I'm in high school, there's no thought process of, of what I'm going to do. Um, I'm just kind of living day by day. I do end up being fairly good at wrestling. I was undefeated my junior and senior year, so I had thought, well, let's give college a whirl. So then I went to Lincoln Junior College, and I had a coach that really took care of me, Dave Clem. Made sure I went to class. He made sure I got a associate's degree. And so from Lincoln Junior College, I go to Eastern Illinois University. As an All-American, right? I was a, I was a two-time All-American at Lincoln Junior College, yes. Uh, got recruited by the sister college there, the, the, the big sister, well, the big brother, we'll say. Eastern. Eastern Illinois, uh, Ralph McCausland. He was a great coach. So I, I was a two-time All-American at Eastern as well. Where's your brother at this point? He goes to Lincoln. Uh, we go to Lincoln College together, and then... Um, he ends up staying at the farm when I go to Eastern. I, I was an All-American at Eastern my first year there, and he sees how much fun I've had and how, uh, how I was an All-American. So he then comes to uh, Eastern for a year for my second year. So you year. can't shake this guy. I can't. <laughs> Wait, just, just to be serious for a moment, though, you, you have an incident that happens in a spillway while you're in college where... You guys are going to hang out, go swimming, and the spillway is gushing. So the last day of school, we've got finals. And if you go to college, you know, you, everybody goes to, does their finals. You're, you're done about midday or, or maybe 3 o'clock. So I'm the first one done. I go for the beer run. We just, we just start having a good time. My closest buddy, Joe, says, hey, let's go slide down the spillway. And I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about, slide down the spillway? At, at Eastern, there's a, there's a big lake, and then there's a, a spillway that comes over, and that spillway is up here, and then there's about, we'll say, a 20-foot, 45-degree uh, angle of concrete, and then there's concrete on the bottom, and then at the end over here is a knee wall, which is about a 3-foot wall, so that way that current water doesn't come down and erode the dirt that's on the other side of that knee it wall. It keeps getting kind of broken up. Yes, so we go there, as soon as we pull up, Joe takes one look at it, and he goes, there's too much water. And I'd never been there, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm confused. So I go, what do you mean, Joe? How can there be too much water to slide down? And he goes, he goes well, there's a, you got a, a situation over here where the water's turning, and, and it's, it's just, it's bad, there's too much water. And I go, nah, come on, Joe, don't, don't do that. And he goes, we came out of there to have fun. And so I kind of, Talk to some guys, and I'm going to swim. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand what's going on. It's my fault. And Tim goes, if you're going to swim, I'm going to swim first. So he, Tim, jumps in. He gets caught in this end whirlpool. He goes in a circle and comes right back around. Looked fun. Tim goes out a second time, walks about four or five feet out farther, slides down the spillway, and gets caught in that circular system. Now the whole time, he's getting farther away from us. It's sucking him to the middle. Just a natural process of the, of the thing. And they, we're all panicking because we know that he's not doing this on purpose. The na Mother Nature is doing everything. It's not, it's not. He has dead. no control. He has no control. Me being Superman, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to save Tim. I jump straight in past the whirlpools on the end. And as soon as I hit the water, my last thought is saving Tim. I remember going through that <clears throat> system three times where you get pulled down at the, at the very bottom when you're traveling to the knee wall, you're just, you're just tossed and turned and pulled and you're just a rag doll. And I can remember going through that, going through that and it's sucking me to the middle where Tim was and I, um, I thought, I gotta get out of here. And so the last time through that system, you get a little air, you know, when you come up and you're traveling back to the spillway, you can get a little couple gulps of air. And I can remember, I've got to have this shoot me out. So when I go, when it sucks me back down by the spillway, by the 45, I tighten up into as tight a ball as I can. And I'm just staying as tight as I can. And they said, when I, sh it shot me out a little bit farther downstream. I get out of the water downstream, run back around. What's going on? After t Joe saw that I couldn't help Tim and I was downstream, Joe jumped in. They both hadn't been seen for, for two to three minutes. 
and they never came out. They never came out. How, how do you process that? Um, I didn't know I was going to get emotional on this show, Joe. You got, it's, me. It's, you got me. It's understandable. I mean, you, you're at a young age, and these are two of your friends that, you know, you're having a great time, and then it's life-changing, life-ending. <clears throat> there, there's, there's guilt. Um, I told Tim, uh, you know, if you don't jump in, I am. And Tim was the one that, that got in the water first. So uh, uh, prob probably should be me that was trapped in that water that day and, and not Tim. But uh, we, were <clears throat> we were just college kids living life. Did you come out of that, that experience a, a changed person in that, you know, if you're drinking beer, you end up down in the spillway, two friends are gone, were you... A more focused guy, or did you go the other way? Were you kind of I, I, I lost? probably went the other way. Um, my mom had always told me I couldn't have a motorcycle because they're too dangerous. As soon as that happened, I told myself that you can go at any day, and you might as well live life a little bit. So I went out and got me a motorcycle because I wanted a motorcycle. Not because I wanted to be dangerous, because I just wanted the enjoyment of a motorcycle. So uh, that's when I got into the to the fighting a little bit. Um, you have a friend that says, hey, why don't you look at this MMA? UFC is, is just starting, but it's not the UFC that people would be familiar with now. It was more tournament style. Um, tournament style, one winner, and no weight classes. An acquaintance, Chris Dwyer, was a, a, a fighter. And he goes, hey, if you want to fight yourself, we've been training for a little while. I'll get you a fight. I said, yeah, give me a fight up there. So my first fight was in 1997, I think, for $100. And I thought I was doing good. I got paid $100 to beat somebody up. I mean, <laughs> life's good. Was it easy for you? Yeah, it was, uh, it was easy because I, I, everybody was a striker. You know, that everybody thought taekwondo or karate or, was the thing to do. And if they're remotely close enough to hit me, I'm way too close to take them down, so I took everybody down and just beat them up on the ground. That's the wrestling, yeah. that's the wrestling overcoming yeah. the striking. Correct. So. Which is an age old battle, wrestler versus striker. Okay, so after you win that first fight, does it dawn on you that, hey, this can be my career, no. this can be? No, You no. just no. took a no. hundred bucks and took bucks, got on your motorcycle fun. and left. <laughs> <laughs> None of that $100 went in my pocket because I told everybody, hey, I'm getting $100, so wherever we go afterwards, whether it's food or beer, my $100 is first. So, so you jump in the ring, you win $100, and We're going to have fun with it. We're going to have fun. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it's competition. Yeah, and, and in your book, you refer to it as, maybe this is a good word, hobby. It, total hobby. It's an it's a, it's a outlet for my competition. UFC at the time seemed like, it was one of those, hey, have you seen this tape? You know, back in the day, it wasn't DVDs. It was, have you seen this tape of this fight? It was, it was kind of underground, right? Very, very underground. Very underground. They would have been on pay-per-view back then, but pay-per-view wasn't a big thing in the early 90s. You know, you, um, so uh, there was, I can remember going in back when there was uh, video marts. You know, I remember going in there, passing a, a uh, VHS that had UFC on it, and that's where you saw it out. And I can remember being around this time, uh, maybe I'd had a fight and maybe I hadn't. We picked up a UFC. The main event was Hoist Gracie versus Dan Severn. And Dan Severn goes through all these other people, and he's the big wrestler, and he's throwing people left and right, and we're like, this wrestler's gonna kill this Brazilian. <laughs> and it gets to the last fight, and Hoist walks out, and he's only about 170 you know, pounds. Hoist has sat in that chair. Has he really? Yeah. Uh, we'll get to that. Go ahead. So, and Mark and I, and I haven't fought a lick professionally. Mark and I have said to each other, we can take that guy. Well, Hoist is not a physically yep. imposing guy. Yes. And you're swinging these axes that have, I mean, you're, oh. you're, you're physically. I'm, I'm you're, at that point, I, I had a body on me. Okay, so I'm, I'm fascinated. You put this tape in. 
And does it, I, I know you say, I, we can take this we'll guy. Take that guy. But are you like in awe, like a, a kid seeing his first baseball game or a kid seeing his first NBA game? Or are you like, oh my God. I never thought, of it. You're, you're right. We, we were just, we were like, this, this is amazing. You know, because Dan, when we saw that very first fighting tape, Dan Severn's a wrestler. That's what my brother and I were. We really related to him because that, that's who we were. And Dan ended up losing that fight but because um, of a, a triangle choke, but we were just amazed that that wrestler went in there and just tore everybody up. But jiu-jitsu, you've got to have jiu-jitsu in your, in your toolbox. When I walk into the cage, I always tell, say, I carry a big toolbox. In my toolbox is my, my ring awareness, my cornerman, my striking, my submissions, my wrestling, uh, the, everything. Every tool that I bring in there that could help me in a fight is in my toolbox. And I always thought I brought a big toolbox in there. But at some point early, you realized your toolbox probably wasn't big enough. I just, my toolbox at that time was a briefcase with wrestling in it. So, uh, yeah, I needed to expand my vocabulary and my discipline. At some point in your life now, at this stage, Monty Cox comes in. And, and he's a former writer who's now a kind of a promoter manager type person. Yeah. And he sees you and he says, you can, you can do this. You yeah. can make a living out of this. A couple fights, uh, that same promotion that I had the $100 fights for, uh, like four months later, I have a fight. He doubles my money. Now I've got $200 to spend at the end of the night. You know, within a fight, I just double my money. And then I fight a third time. And after that third fight, he goes, hey, you sign on with me and I'll take you places. And so, uh, yeah, it's interesting where I started. The people that happened to be there that made a huge part in my life. Well, you enter a tournament and you end up fighting Dennis Hallman. What, what was it like going into that fight for you? W were you intimidated? Were you excited? I mean, what were you? I knew nothing about Dennis Hallman. Um, um, I'd had a, a it was a tournament, so I had three fights that night. First fight was against a guy named Victor Hunsacker, and I beat him up in, in, we'll say, 30 seconds or something. My second fight was against a guy named Dave Monet, who ended up being a, four, uh, a UFC welterweight champ, UFC middleweight champion. Tell me, is this taking place in the same day? This is, this is half an hour before you see this fight right here. I go three with him, then I've got 15, 20 minute break, and then I fight, come back and fight Dennis Hall. All right, let's take a look. So 17 seconds, but it's a move there. I mean, it's, did that show you that you can be the meanest, toughest, strongest guy, but there's technique here too? Yeah, yeah it was a great learning experience. And um, it's hard to learn from a, lo from a win. When you win, you got your hand in the air, you just don't think about it. But a loss, you learn a lot from. So that was a great, great moment for me to, to know I gotta learn something. Yeah, maybe this is a good time for your quote. You say, if you're undefeated, then you're not fighting the right people. I love that. I mean, that, that can apply to anything in life, right? If you're not challenging yourself and, and taking some losses, you're, you're not progressing. And, and like I just said, I think that you, you really, as a person and as a competitor, you learn from those losses so much. It makes you so much better down the road. So, so I think, a, you know, a, a good loss is, is going to help you out. If I would have won that, I would have had a you know, maybe, maybe seven hundred fifty dollars, five hundred to seven hundred fifty dollars payout, which is worth worth the drive for me. You know, so this competition's starting to turn into into a sport. Yeah, and, because think of what it's satisfying for you, right? I mean, you're a, a kid who grew up with not much and kind of fighting for your own and trading pants with your brother, and you know, you're you're so competitive and you're so good and so talented. And now you're out of college, and this is scratching that itch, and yes. somebody's handing you maybe 500, 700 bucks. I'm working for an electrician, which I love working with my hands, and I'm managing a bar at night as well. So I'm very busy, I'm very active, I'm really loving life. I'm on a camp college campus. Have a I'm girlfriend. Making, I've got a girlfriend, I'm making good money with the electrician, I'm having fun with the nightlife, so I, life's good for me. But I'm here I am, I've got one foot, at college and one foot 
in the cage. And my mom comes up to me and she says, you can't do that. She goes, if you're going to do this sport, you need to put both feet in the cage. At some point, Pat Militich comes into your that, life. That's where he comes. I had dabbled with, uh, I'd went to Pat's like on weekends, Pat's gym up in Iowa on weekends. So you get this experience with Hallman and, and you say, okay, Pat Militich, I'm coming to Iowa. I stop everything I'm doing here, move to Iowa full time. Leave the girlfriend. Leave, I leave everything. I picked up, packed up my pickup truck and I went to Iowa. And after you get with Militich, you win the next four fights and now you're on the UFC radar, right? That's like yes. being, that's like the big league club. That is the big show. That looking at, yep. you know, they're, they're scouting for talent who's good mm -hmm. and now you're on their radar. And I've, I've done two things. I've, I've got Pat Militich as my trainer. Set times, we do this, you know. It's a job. It's a job. Walk in the gym twice a day. Um, I've got Monty Cox, my manager. Now I've got somebody going out looking for fights for me. He's setting my, he, I got a guy now that is setting my career up. He's trying to get me in the UFC. So those two things are crucial for me because if I don't have a good trainer, I'm not a great athlete. And if I don't have a good manager, nobody's going to know who I am. So Val Ignatov, so UFC 22. 22. And you're a part of it. This isn't a title fight. This is just part just a, of. Just a three round fight. Part of the night. Yep. And what was that like for you? That, that's like stepping in. This, this is, I would imagine, you fighting for the first time in front of a crowd that is. Yeah, a very sizable crowd. And the first time that I'm going to be on pay-per-view. And you won. I won. So you beat Val. Beat Val. So now the UFC not only has given you the opportunity, but you've kind of, in a way, paid it back by winning. Yep, I, I won. I won very decisively. They liked how I competed. And um, so I'm on a great road right now. And you go on a tear right after that, though. You yep. won 13 fights in a yeah, year. I yeah, yeah. I know. The, I can tell you the losses. I can't tell you the wins. 2001, you get your first UFC title fight. No, November. So Carlos Newton is the guy you're going to fight. Yes. Now, Militic had just lost to him. Yes. And there was an opportunity for Militic to fight Newton. And Militic, this tells you a lot about Militic too, you kind of wanted to give it the opportunity yeah. to Pat. So and he said, no, you do it. The phone rings. Go to the phone. Monty Cox, Monty, my manager, goes, hey, I got your next fight. You're fighting for the title. I go, no, I'm not. He goes, yeah, yeah, you're going to fight Carlos Newton for the title. I go, no, I'm not. I go, that's Pat's fight. Pat gets that fight. Pat was the five-time defending champion. He should fight this guy, not me. And they go, they won't, they, won't let you, they won't let Pat have that fight. They want new blood in there. If you don't take the fight, it's going to go to somebody else. I go, I'm not doing it. Pat gets on the phone and goes, if you don't take this fight, that title could go to another gym. We don't want that. You have to take that fight. I said, Pat. That's coming from you. I take the fight. How are you preparing for this title fight? I'm training like no other. It's, it's weird, and you guys are going to think, think I'm weird, but our gym was set up on love. We, I loved the guys that went in there every day. So when, when Pat had a fight coming up, uh, we all concentrated on Pat. We didn't hit him. We didn't hurt him. He got to beat us up in preparation for that. But um, I wanted to see Pat win more than Pat wanted to win. And we all thought the same way about each other. So we had a lot of love in that gym up in Iowa. And so when I had this title fight coming up, the guy who beat Pat Militich, everybody was helping me out. I didn't have to look for training partners. They were there at my door waiting for me. Let's watch uh, UFC 34. So great. I... Were you, was there a moment there where you were both out? There was couple seconds there where I didn't know where I was at. So you was, were getting choked. I was getting choked in that, uh, in that submission hold. And I knew that if I slammed him, I couldn't, that was my defense. The same thing when I lost to Dennis Holloman, I tried picking him up off that triangle. So that's just my defense. Pick him up. When he realizes he's up in the air, he's going to release those legs because he knows I can slam him down. He didn't, he didn't release his legs. I take my right leg and I step back and I slam him. And so I give everything into it. And in that process of me slamming him, he releases his legs, natural release, because he goes totally unconscious. And now blood starts pumping back into my head. 
So that's, it's, it's, not a, it's not a quick process of getting your, 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 your bearings. So it takes me probably a good two seconds before I realize. Which I'm sure feels longer than what we think yeah, two I'm, seconds are. When I, when I post, I'm looking up, and Jeremy Horn, my cornerman, guy who taught me a lot, is over the cage. So as I do this, I know something's not right because Jeremy shouldn't be over the cage. And he goes, he goes, the fight's over. You just won. You're the champion. Well, when I hear that, I'm wide awake now. Right. <laughs> I, I was very aware where my cornerman was. Uh, they were here. And I was always aware where my crowd was. They were over here. So when I step up and push off the cage like that over on top of the cage, I'm right in front of my corner, my, 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 my town. Who, okay, I was going to ask you, who's in your crowd? Uh, at that fight, there's probably 80 people from my town of 5,000. From Hillsborough? From Hillsborough, Hillsborough area. Is that when the marquee in town said, welcome to Hughesboro? That, I think that's awesome that they, that they changed that in Hillsborough, town of 5,000. But, okay, so you get up. Yep. Now you're a champion. What does that feel like to be a UFC champion? Um, I don't go to sleep that night. It's the first time I laid in my bed looking at the ceiling. Um, I, just, I just couldn't go to sleep that, that night. Um, just, I, I never thought, I didn't get in the sport to, um, I didn't get in the sport to be a world champion. I didn't get in the sport thinking I could support a family with it. Uh, I just didn't get in the sport thinking it was going to be a career. I got in the sport just because it was fun. You defend your title five times over two years. So this, this is a sustained amount yeah. of success. And I know the answer to this before I ask it, but you know, I, I know that you didn't let yourself get complacent with a title, right? I mean, that, that probably, knowing you the little I do, made you work even harder. It, it, it did. So yeah, I'm, I'm fighting, I'm doing well, I'm, I'm really, I'm kind of smashing everybody. So I do get to where I'm super competitive, but it, it just kind of gets easy. Y you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to brag, but it, I, I was just, I was just, the people that were putting in front of me weren't giving me the challenge that I should have had. Can you describe what it's like when you get in to the octagon? When I walk in the octagon, I'm mad. Uh, I walk in the octagon, most of the time I'm second. The challenger will walk in first, the champ will walk in second. And I'm mad. He's in my house and he thinks he's gonna beat me. And I don't like it. I don't like it a bit. And I, I try- I mean, Is it a rush? Is it like- it's, it's anger. It's anger. Now I don't go out to try and hurt somebody. I, I don't. I go out to win. You know, when the ref stops the rounds, I don't get any extra shots in. I'm a very clean fighter. But I'm mad that guy thinks he's going to beat me in my house. You know, UFC 46, though, rolls around, and this guy, BJ Penn, had moved up a weight class to fight. Which is a big mistake. You don't, in, in the wrestling world, you don't go from a lighter weight class and challenge somebody in a heavier weight class. That doesn't happen. You don't do that. Challenge, not only challenge somebody in a higher weight class, but challenging somebody who's rolling and, by your yeah, own admission, I'm, smashing guys. Yes. You don't, you don't go up from a lower weight class and challenge the champion. Uh, but he did. He did. And how did you take that fight? You know what I mean? How, how, how were you looking at that leading into it? Uh, I, I thought, here's BJ Penn, a little bitty guy. He's going to bump up. I'm going to take him. I'm going to pick him up. I'm going to put him on my finger. I'm going to spin him around a little bit like a basketball. Right. I'm going to drop him, and then I'm going to do what I do. And um, mentally, I could have been a lot stronger. Physically, I was there. Here's UFC 46, BJ Penn. He's got nasty hands. Mm. BJ and you got a kiss at the end of that. <laughs> yeah, you're right. BJ and I are very good friends now, so um, it doesn't bother me that my buddy beat me. At least he got, <laughs> at least he got something out of it. And I, I got a lot out of that fight, too. That was, a, that was a great fight for me. Knowing you now, how we all know you, I, that moment where you're tapping out, I, I, I would imagine that is just crushing to you. Usually I, I don't... I don't tap. Um, usually, I just go out. You know, they just, I just let them. You'll, you'll pass out before you tap. Like, like Dennis Holloman did on the, on the first video. Uh, I don't, I don't want to tap. And you saw the punch, and you probably heard it. When he come in with that big right hand. I mean, that's a full body. He totally dazed me. 
that big punch is what set up that submission hold. So you were doing things that were out of character because yes. you were out of it. Yeah, I wasn't thinking. So tell me about your big life change when you went to Mexico in 2004. This is, this is one of the important junctures in your life. When I started dating my wife, she had a boy, and we both thought it was best for that boy to, to grow up in a church. So we started going to church. Several of my small area friends went to that church, so got to pal around with my, my friends, make some new friends. So my church, me and my church buddies were playing poker, uh, small game poker. It got brought up about, hey, why don't you guys come to this mission trip? Uh, they go down to Mexico, they go to an orphanage, and they work for five days, and they come back. You see a painting while you're down there that speaks to you. It's called Who Cares? When I see this picture, things start going off in my mind that there's something I'm missing in life. And then I figure out I'm, I'm one of the guys in the water. No doubt. Needing help. Needing help. To get up on the platform. Yep, to get to safety. At the very end, I realized that the people on top that you can see, they're close to safety. The people below the water that you can't see, they're nowhere near safety. I said, you can't even see me in that picture. I'm so far deep in the water. Can I ask you if, if there's any worry on your part that becoming kind of a deeper thinker, a deeper person that, you know, now we're talking about God and we're talking, you're seeing this painting and it's moving you in a way that you haven't been moved before. If that's going to somehow take the edge off the fighter that is Matt Hughes. You know, um, after I become a Christian, I, um, you know, I, I just, I try not to worry about it. Just so, but as any parent out here will tell you, I started having kids with my wife. Uh, had a little girl that I fell in love with. You won't worry? You, then now you got worry. And, I've got, and you hang around a girl all day and it's going to soften you up and you become a Christian and, and it's, it's going to soften you up. You know, Now I had to find intent and I'm big on intent. What was my purpose? What is my purpose walking into that octagon? Before it was to tear somebody's arm off and beat them with it. <laughs> now my intent is to get my hand raised, which is not as effective as, as the other. And so with with Finding God and my little girl being born, I, I it just life softened. And I turned in my late 30s, my mid to late 30s, so things just change. Okay, so a couple months later, it's UFC 50, and GSP, George St. Pierre, gets his title shot at you. After the loss to Penn, which precedes this fight, are, are you ready for a, 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 the title shot here? Yeah, I think I'm ready. Um, this is George and I's first fight. We fight, ended up fighting three times. And my manager called me up and says, hey, I'm think I'm going to put you against this George, see, push you against this George St. Pierre guy. He's looking very tough, and you're going to have to fight him down the road, so let's catch him early, he said. Let's catch him early in his career, get a win off him now, then you're not going to have to fight him for quite a little while. I said, I didn't know who George was. I said, whatever. I, I really, and I'm sure there's a lot of guys like me, I fought whoever they brought in front of me. I didn't, I never said no. You let other people pick that stuff. Yeah, I don't care. GSP, UFC 50. So St. Pierre comes in and overextends himself. I don't believe that. There it is. Matt Hughes 101 into the guard, and the guard is open. Matt Hughes is so powerful. I got to tell you, I'm very impressed with St. Pierre right now. Bloodied up just a little bit, the right eye. Oh, Spinning back kick into the midsection hurt. of Matt Hughes. And Matt trying to finish this round one with a flurry and scores some points. Matt Hughes with a submission, uh, and it's all over. It's nice. all over. Matt Hughes with a submission victory. Bang, armbar, over. Matt Hughes is once again the welterweight champion. When you, when you lost a home in early, you didn't have that, did no, you? No, no, that would have been something I would have picked up at Pat's. To the novice or to somebody who doesn't watch these fights, it looks so innocent, right? I mean, you guys are throwing each other. You, you get that kick to the stomach and all that. And then it ends because you have his arm in a position where 
he either gives hurts, up. Hurts real bad. Or he has a broken arm. Yeah. In, in, in the UFC world, you can make one big mistake and lose the fight, or you can put several small mistakes together. And George put several small mistakes together there, and I was able to capitalize and, and get the armbar. How good did that feel coming off all of that to win that fight? I, I felt I'm back. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm back. I've, I've r really, l life isn't any better. You know, I've got a, I got a, a great wife. I've got kids at home. Um, I've got God in my life. I've got my UFC title back. I mean, does it, what else is there? After you win and you're a champion again, are you as motivated to continue to work as hard as you did to become that champion again? Um, I, I, you know, it, natural progress and you're gonna go up, you're gonna try and I mean, be a champion. You're in your mid 30s by now, mid to getting to late 30s. Yeah, I'm. I'm Right at the, the end of my, so I'm probably, you know, 33, 34. So I'm still extremely competitive. Just I'm not quite my prime, but I'm not over the hill yet. I love this next fight we're going to show. UFC 52, Frank Trigg. Oh, yeah, yeah. This Dana White calls his favorite fight. Dana White, the head of the UFC for the longest time. Um, he says this, this is the one because it really kind of encompasses everything and, and I looking at it I can say that because when I see a fight I don't want to see the champion go out there and destroy the competitor I'd like to see that champion go through a round or two that he loses and see how he reacts from that and then he comes back and wins the fight at the end so That's I what like, all the great movies are like that. I like roller coaster rides when I watch a fight you what'd you think of Trigg I didn't like him Different than, let's say, B.J. Penn or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I always thought the, the purpose of a fighter is to talk inside the octagon, not outside. F Frank liked to talk, and he got under my skin how his, his upbringing was better than, my, was better than mine, uh, his wrestling was better than mine, with his family life was... I mean, everything was better than mine. You know, and it really got under my skin. If you if you had lost the will to hurt the guy. Oh, I got it back with him. Oh, that's, that's what I was going to ask you. Did you go in there wanting to hurt him? Yeah, and I was highly motivated to be the best Matt Hughes to face Frank Trigg because I don't mind losing to somebody that I like. But, man, if I want to lose to somebody that I don't like and let them be able to gloat at me and have a, have a win over me, so... So uh, this, this was a big fight. Mentally, I was, I would have been highly trained for this. No matter where I was in my age, I don't know how old I was for this, but I would have been, I would have been ready for this fight. Here it is. Man, that, I mean, that's got every, that's like a movie script that was played out in real life. Now, what people may not have seen was, as, as the announcer said, the unintentional yeah. Low shot. He, he, the ref didn't see it, and he got you below the belt. You know, I got hit low, and he threw a knee, and it hit me right in the cup. And the, just took all the energy out, you know, from me. And, and that, if you were not already furious, you know, that, that was a cheap shot, low blow. Cheap shot, low blow. I'm not furious at the moment because I'm in the middle of a fight. And I turn this way, and I, I turn this way to, to fend Frank off, and I look up at the ref to see if he, if he saw it. Mario Yamasaki is the ref right there. He saw the low blow, but he just didn't get in there. You know what I'm saying? He, wasn't, he should give you a moment to recover. He, I would have got five minutes to recover from that day. But he just did, it just didn't happen, which plays later on in the fight. So Frank gets me down. He's beating me up. And Mario is now knowing that he made a mistake. He didn't get in there on this low shot. So I get more time because nobody is cheering for me more than Mario Yamasaki right now. <laughs> because if this fight, if Frank wins this fight, my corner and my manager are going to testify and there's going to be, there's going to be some problems. If I win this fight, nobody's going to say anything. So Mario is rooting for me at this moment. <laughs> so he gives me more time on the ground to get my, the, probably another ref would have stopped the fight because I wasn't defending myself. So when, when, when you watch that, are you thinking, man, I'm close to I'm close to losing this? I was out. I was out. I obviously did some things, natural reaction, and when I woke up, 
he was mounted on me. He was mounted on me. And now, I'm, now, that, now that I've woke up and I replay the fight, I'm mad. Now, I had a lot of motivation to beat Frank Trigg before this fight, but I'm mad in this fight now. But it looked like you hung on there a little after the fight was over. <laughs> the rules say stop fighting, not when you hear the bell, but when the ref pulls you apart. So I wanted to make sure that was the ref's arm pulling my arm off him, <laughs> not somebody else's. In other words, you stayed a little long. He had to pull my arm off, yeah. Let's talk about the Gracies. Um, UFC 60, you have a fight with Hoist, as, as we've already stated. Now, Hoist is, is an older guy yeah. Yeah. at this point. Uh, he's one of the, he's the first guy, uh, the first champion, uh, and somebody who, let's just say they're not lacking for confidence. Yeah, definitely. So would you consider yourself a Gracie fan? Yeah, yes, without Hoist and the Gracie family starting the UFC, I, I wouldn't be here in this chair once okay, again. Okay, but what about the fighting and the, you know, the way they go about inside the octagon? I, I, if I had to I say they're very effective with what they do. What they're, I would say their problem is they don't, they don't branch out. You know, you, he's going in with a very limited toolbox, as I say before, just grappling. It's, and, and it's what, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. How did you prepare for, for that fight? That, um, I was the champion at the time I fought Hoist, and they, for some reason, they didn't want to give him a title shot. So they made it, um, they made it a catch weight, 175. So I had five extra pounds, and I was gonna, I was gonna fill it full of muscle. It's interesting, because you have him in an arm bar. A straight, a straight arm bar, yes. And, and he's just kind of like a and, robot. Uh, but, but I wasn't using my hips for that, I was using my arms, so I don't have a whole lot of power, and I'm using a lot of strength to try and apply that hold. So I thought, I'm not gonna waste my energy trying to get him to tap when a Gracie never taps, you know? So I, I thought... Move I just, on? <laughs> I'm gonna move on exactly what I thought. I'll just catch him in something else. You're, you're a big star now in the UFC um, at this point. I'm, I'm obviously... this, was a, this, was a, this brought my stock in the UFC up quite a bit. Are you enjoying the spoils of fame? Are you just retreating to the farm or what, what's... You know what I mean? Are, are you living the life? Life is fun. Getting recognized is not, uh, is not something I look for. I've know, I know several fighters that they live to get recognized. I, I don't live for that, but it's sure nice to get seated at a restaurant quicker because I'm Matt Hughes. <laughs> Man's got to eat. Man's got to eat. And my wife makes a lot of her decisions through her stomach. Uh-huh. <laughs> If I'm gonna ask a big question, she's gonna have a good meal in front of her first. UFC 63 BJ Penn rematch. Tell me about that leading in, because let's say- He beat know, me before. He'd beaten you before. Took my belt. So while I know you're confident and think you can beat him, are you thinking, well, I hope this rematch goes a little better than the first time I did this? I am, I am worried, because BJ went on to beat other people. I mean, he just wasn't a fluke. He came up to 170 and beat me. He, he was a 70 pounder, he'd beat other people. Um, so yes, yes, I was worried. I took the fight, the fight very serious. Uh, at this point in my career, I get a boxing coach and I let him study BJ Penn. I was very good about relying on people. Like I said, one of the, one of the best thing that happened to me is I always had good people around me that helped me, that wanted to help me. So uh, my, my boxing coach come up with a game plan. He, he did all, looked at all the tape on BJ and realized that BJ loves his hook. Uh, he's, he's conventional, his right hand's his power hand, but he, he always goes to his hook. So he had me stepping properly away where BJ would throw that hook and it's like I could smell that leather go by and he couldn't hurt me because my boxer had me sitting in the right spots. Are, are you at the whim and the beck and call of Dana White? Is that how this is run? Like, I, I work other sports, so I know that every Sunday there's a football game and then there's a, you know, baseball, they know their schedule. Is this kind of a, hey, when they say jump, I gotta go? So, so typically I was fighting with the, when I won the belt, I was fighting about three times a year. And I, that, that was a good schedule for me. Later on in my career, after I had lost it and I won it back again, and, and uh, 
lost it then for the last time. I slowed down a little bit and I did like two fights a year or something, or maybe even at the very end it was a, one fight a year. So, so yeah, but, but Joe, I enjoyed what I did. I, I loved it. So I, I, I would have fought more if I could. That's the hard thing. And, and you know, I've, I've said this to other MMA fighters, UFC guys, you know, this isn't like Willie Mays staying too long in baseball or name the football player who just hung on maybe a year too long. This, you hang on too long in this sport and you may not get out of the octagon. Yeah, yeah. Do you like where the UFC is today? Are you a fan of it? I think it's too commercial. Uh, they've, got, they've got fights darn near every week and uh, whether one of the three channels are on. And I just, I think it's too commercial. I am so happy that timing worked out for me where I fought when I did. I, I really think that I fought in the golden ages. Started in UFC 22 and I don't even know what my last one was. It was, it was when people got together to watch the UFC. Y right. You know, it wasn't, because yeah. they're, they're, so, they're so often now. And I just- They're not, they're not as special. They're not, they're, that's a great way to term it. They're just not as special. And what's next? What's next for you? I'm 43 years old. I would love, I'm kind of in shape. I just came from the show Kingdom. I've been filming for a show called Kingdom. I just did a five round fight yesterday, a TV fight. Had a lot of fun, <laughs> had a lot of fun. We like to end with fun questions. This whole thing has been fun uh, and enlightening. Would you rather fly like Superman or swing like Spider-Man? We're talking right now, right, right now, now, right now, fly. You'd rather fly. Yep. There was a time in your life you'd like yep. to Spider-Man your way around. Danger. I, I like, I love adventure. And with that swinging, you'd, you'd have adventure every, all the time. Would you rather fight Barney or Big Bird? <laughs> Do you know, you know who Barney is? Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got Hill kids. Hill Lilligan. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get my ass kicked. <laughs> For some reason, when I was a kid watching Sesame Street, I didn't like Big Bird. Okay. So I, I... Look into the camera and say, I'm coming for you, Big, Big Bird. You're mine. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're coming out here in a little bit. <laughs> All right, last question. What makes a great fighter? You can take this any way you want. What makes a great fighter in Matt Hughes' uh, mind? You know, if somebody's coming to me, if I'm making a recipe, my first thing is, the strong mind that I can't put into people, uh, then I would say a big toolbox. What are you gonna bring in in the octagon? Your, all your training and, um, and will. You know, will, when I would, if I have to use me as a prime example, because these people have seen it, when I got hit low, I didn't wanna lose. And there's a time in there where I could have, I could have checked out and nobody would have said I was wrong for checking out. So I, but I didn't, I didn't wanna lose. So I think Will uh, would be in there too, but that, that's what I think makes, makes a great fighter. Well, here's a guy who grew up in Hillsboro, Illinois. At one point they called it Hughesboro, Illinois, because they're so proud of their son in this town of 5,000 people. Grew up on a farm and became one of the stars of UFC and is a great father and was a great son, a great brother, and a tremendous friend. So ladies and gentlemen, please give your appreciation for the Hall of Famer, Matt Hughes. Thank you. Thank you guys.